Hey everyone, welcome back to Tier and Apologetics. Super pumped to join us today to have Dr. Stephen Meyer. Um, he's got his PhD in the philosophy of science from Cambridge, and we're talking about like intelligent design and like everything that entails and looking at some objections to it. So, Dr. Meyer, thank you. Welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me with you, Jack. Or Zach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm great. And I was looking for a bio, and it looked like Wikipedia already determined like this is pseudoscience. I guess we're just kind of wasting our time. Um, so, yeah. It's been very nice of them to settle the debate with a, a single pejorative term like that, when then no one really <laughs> has to think about it. We just decided. yeah. There's no evidence for design because Wiki says it's pseudoscientific. I've been upgraded, though. I, earlier, they had me listed as an American theologian, which they meant as a, a, a put down. And uh, I don't have any degrees in theology, so they finally corrected that. But now I'm a pseudoscientist. So. Mm. Well, do you want to talk a little bit about Dr. Meyer, like about who you are and what you're all about, in case people don't know um, who you are, who listening is? Well, sure. I um, started out in the field of uh, geophysics, and uh, I did a double major when I was in college in physics and geology and a minor in philosophy and ended up working in the oil industry doing digital signal processing of seismic data for four years. And then um, I got a rotary scholarship to go to England and ended up landing in Cambridge where I did first a master's degree in the history and philosophy of science and then stayed on to do a PhD in the field of philosophy of science, and my dissertation was on origin of life biology. So I'm kind of all an all mixed up interdisciplinary sort of person. I've got physics, geology, biology, and, and philosophy all in my background. Um, and But I've been intensely interested in questions that are at the intersection of science and philosophy since I was quite a bit younger and have written now three books um, about the question of design in nature, uh, the first being Signature in the Cell, which was about the origin of the first life. The second, Darwin's Doubt, was which, which was about the problem of the origin of the first animal life. And then the last, the most recent book, Return of the God Hypothesis, is building on the case for intelligent design I made in the first two books um, and addressing the question of the identity of the designing intelligence that I've argued is evident in the the complexity and in informational properties of living systems. And I do that by uh, drawing on not only evidence from biology, but also evidence from cosmology and physics and, and make a case for theism as the best metaphysical explanation of the evidence we have about biological, physical, and cosmological origins. So um, that's kind of a mouthful and we can unpack that. But that's kind of been my my trajectory. Mm, it's super cool. So to give you a flavor of what's happening in this interview to anyone listening, we're just going to survey what ID is and like get into some objections. So like, what is the intelligent design movement like all about? I feel like you're going to summarize it in a couple minutes, um, Dr. Meyer. Like, what's going on here? Well, it's about advancing the case for intelligent design and using intelligent design as a guide to discovery in science. So it has a it's two pronged in that sense. Um, and the, the idea of intelligent design is the, or the theory of intelligent design asserts that there are certain features of biological systems and of the universe, of life and the universe that are best explained by the action of a designing mind as opposed to an undirected or unguided process such as in the biological realm, natural selection acting on random variation. So it's the idea that intelligent agency provides the best explanation of certain detectable features in nature. Mm. So what then, like you talked about, like you've done a bunch of different books, and, like you have like even like the signature in the cell in the background here. Um, like why think that this ID movement is true? Like what, what what's the like work that's going to like try to show us that like this ID movement really has some credibility in thinking that there is some sort of intelligent designer? Well, it, the, the, our, it, the, the reason to think it's true is that the evidence for intelligent design is best explained by the activity of the designing intelligence. And the arguments that I've made in my books have been to that effect. I've used, I use a method of reasoning that's common in science and especially in the historical sciences. It's called the method of inference to the best explanation. It happens to be the same method that Darwin used in The Origin of Species. And uh, what I do is I look at, in the case of living systems, certain features of those systems that have uh, proven to be quite perplexing to evolutionary biologists. They're not things that are explained by processes that we see at work in nature today, but they are 
things that we know from our uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning, are produced by the activity of intelligent agents. For example, the digital code that's stored in the DNA molecule. You go back to the 1950s and 60s during the period of time that historians of science now call the molecular biological revolution. You'll remember that Watson and Crick first elucidated the structure of DNA in 1953. And then in 1958, uh, Francis Crick working on his own um, <clears throat> formulated something called the sequence hypothesis where he proposed that the, the four uh, subunits, the four different types of chemical subunits that run up and down the spine of the double helix, the DNA double helix, uh, are functioning like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters like the zeros and ones in a section of software code. Um, and the, the information bearing properties of DNA were then confirmed by a series of extraordinary experiments over the next seven, seven years as a molecular biologist worked out what's now called the gene expression system or the system for protein synthesis. Crick was correct that the digital information in DNA directs the construction of proteins and protein machines. And as that, that information, that uh, insight sunk in, this has created a huge impasse in the field of origin of life biology. Um, people trying to explain the origin of life by undirected chemical evolutionary processes have uh, been stymied by the presence of the information and information storage, transmission and processing system in DNA um, because uh, the uh, chemical processes, chemical reactions between constituent parts of even the DNA molecule itself do not generate the sequence specific information that's necessary to produce proteins and therefore life. Uh, in other words, getting from chemistry to code has been has proven intractable for origin of life researchers. But we do know of a cause. Um, that is capable of generating information, especially information in a digital form. And that cause is, is intelligence. Uh, Bill Gates, our uh, software developer here in the Seattle area, has said that um, DNA is like a software program, but much more complex than any we've ever created. We know from our experience that software comes from programmers, from intelligent agents. We know more generally that whenever we find information, especially if in a digital or typographic or alphabetic form, and we trace that information back to its ultimate source, whether we're talking about uh, a paragraph in a book or a hieroglyphic inscription or even information embedded in a radio signal, we always come back to a mind, not a material process. And so the discovery of information at the foundation of life and even the very simplest cells on the planet suggests the activity of a designing intelligence in the, in the origin of of the first life. Um, it takes a mind to generate information. We find information at the foundation of life in DNA and RNA. Uh, the best explanation, therefore, of the origin of those information bearing molecules necessary to life is intelligent design. Mm. So I think what a lot of people wonder, Dr. Meyer, with like ID is like, how is it going to be this? from like a god of the gaps argument um because people might say like hey if we're looking at id a lot of what's trying to do is like go against like if say like especially in like biology um trying to show like how evolutionary models may be like insufficient to explain certain mechanisms um but then say like they're better invoked by like design um so someone gonna wonder like well it, like why couldn't there just be like a gap in our understand in our understanding or something along these lines so like what makes id different that it's not just like a mere god of the gaps argument well, notice how I just made the argument. I didn't appeal only to the insufficiency of known evolutionary processes. In fact, I didn't say very much about this in my previous answer, though I could have. The book uh, highlighted on, the, on my shelf back there, the signature in the cell, uh, is over 500 pages, and it goes into specific, it provides specific critiques of the main categories of chemical evolutionary um, explanation. So there's explanations based on chance. There's explanations based on uh, self-organizational processes of, of necessity, law-like necessity, and explanations that attempt to combine the two, that combine chance and necessity. And invariably, each of these types of, of uh, explanations or proposed explanations for the origin of the information necessary to build the first cell have come to a point of impasse. There's a either a severe empirical or theoretical, or conceptual, 
difficulties or all three with each of those types of explanations. But I don't argue for intelligent design merely on the basis of the failure of these naturalistic models. Instead, I argue for intelligent design based on our positive knowledge of the mm -hmm. cause and effect structure of the world. That is to say that we know from our uniform and repeated experience that it takes a mind to generate information in a digital or alphabetic form. Uh, the uh, early information theorist who, uh, an early information theorist who applied information theory to molecular biology named Henry Quassler said that, that um, uh, the origin of information is habitually associated with conscious activity. That's what we know from experience. And so that's positive knowledge we have. That's not a gap in our knowledge, that's positive knowledge that we have. So when we're trying to reconstruct the past, we need to do so, this is Darwin's method, on the basis of our knowledge of cause and effect. Or, and, and Darwin got this method from the geologist Charles Lyell, who said that historical scientists should be looking for causes now in operation. In other words, our knowledge of cause and effect should guide our reconstruction of what most likely happened in the past. And that's precisely the method we follow. So if I were to have argued, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, Alexander Oparin's theory of chemical evolution fails to explain the origin of the biological information you need to produce the first cell for the following reasons, boom, 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 whatever they are. Therefore, it was intelligent designed. That would be a God of the gaps argument because I'm not providing a positive reason to consider design as a causally adequate explanation for the phenomenon of interest. But that's not how we argue we proponents of intelligent design. We point to our the known process, the, the, we point to our experience of nature to show that intelligent agents can and do provide or, or can and do produce the kind of information that's present in the cell, specified complexity or functional information. Um, as opposed to mere Shannon information. And then we infer intelligent design based on our knowledge of those cause and effect relationships that we see at work in nature. One thing that also supports this inference is the experience we've gained from prebiotic simulation experiments themselves in the field of origin of life biology. Invariably, what happens in those experiments, the experiments are designed to simulate what happened on the early earth. So they're using this historical scientific method so you, the idea is the scientist puts together some brew of chemicals in the laboratory and hopes that those that combination of chemicals under certain conditions will produce some biologically relevant uh, subunits or monomers or, or uh, uh, parts of a cell. Um, unfortunately, what is invariably the case is that uh, in order to move those experiments in a life-friendly direction, to get an outcome that is life-relevant, invariably the investigator has to manipulate the experiment to a very high degree. Uh, the the uh, prebiotic simulation experimenter will uh, purchase uh, highly refined chemical reagents. He'll introduce them at particular times, in particular measures, in particular combinations with other purified chemicals. He'll remove um, uh, the unwanted um, byproducts of those reactions to prevent interfering cross reactions. At every point in the, along the way, there's intelligent intervention is necessary to move in a life-friendly direction. And that, I think, actually helps us understand why the inference to intelligent design makes so much sense, because those, those experiments are designed to simulate what would be necessary on the early earth to produce life? If invariably you need an intelligent, an intervention of an intelligent agent to move things in a life-friendly direction, you're, you have to ask, what are you simulating? I think you're simulating what we know from other realms of experience, which is that it takes a mind, it takes an intelligence to generate information. And in fact, every time the prebiotic experimenter is saying, I want this outcome, not that, I want this chemical, not that, he or she is introducing a bit or more of information because information in the theoretical sense relates to this idea of the exclusion of some possibilities and the election of others. Every time you exclude a zero and elect a one, you've imparted a bit of information 
into your into your system if you're in working with digital code. And so those interventions, that investigator interference involves the in, input of information into a physical system and it's coming from an intelligence. And that, that, that's therefore evidence of the causal powers, the causal adequacy of intelligent agents to produce biologically relevant uh, information or complexity. So again, that's, that's positive knowledge, not a gap in our knowledge that we're using to infer to intelligent design. So the intelligent design argument is not an argument from ignorance, but an inference to the best explanation. I am mm -hmm. in quite a bit more detail in the uh, in Signature in the Cell and in the more recent book, Return of the God Hypothesis. You can see logically uh, that the, the two forms of inference are very different. One is an informal fallacy. The other is the way science works. Mm. Yeah, I think that's super helpful, um, Dr. Martin, thinking about this, looking at ideas like you're talking about how like we're looking at like different like biological mechanisms. We have these things that like require like like intentional like agency to like move forward. Like it's not just like mere like um, thinking about like a guy of the gaps of like maybe like why lightning strikes given like the weather process where there, there is some sort of like explanation that we don't need to like put in like intentional agency into that. Whereas with like ID, like you're saying like, hey, we have these mechanisms like they, they do require like intentional agency to get from like point A to point B. Is that is that right? Well, right. The uh, if you if you in, if you can't accomplish a successful simulation of the production of even the building blocks of life without the without the intervention of a mind at multiple steps along the way. And this is known as the problem of investigator interference in, in prebiotic simulation experiments, then uh I think nature is, is talking back. Nature is telling us something. You can't get from here to there where there is an information-rich system unless you've had input from a mind. That's what our uniform and repeated experience affirms. And that's why, and, and that experience is, is a form of knowledge. So we're not making our inference to a design on the basis of ignorance, which is the informal fallacy, uh, but rather on the basis of knowledge. Mm, and yeah, course, it's, not, not, it's not a God of the gaps. God of the gaps is just a, a colloquial way of referring to a invoking God as a cover for ignorance of causal processes that are are sufficient to produce something. It's in other words, it's, it's a, col a colloquial way of referring to an argument from ignorance. We're not making an argument from ignorance. Mm, yeah, I think that's great. So let's look well, at like inference to the best as explanation based on our positive knowledge of the features of the, of the cell and our positive knowledge of the cause and effect structure of the world. Okay. Yeah. Super helpful. So maybe then let's like get into some objections. Um, so one thing I wonder is like, we, we can invoke the, like the idea, like, yeah, there is some designer, but then there's this question of like, like what on earth, like why would a designer be interested in like designing parts of biology? Um, like I was reading your book. Um, it was Darwin's doubt. And I was thinking about this. I was like, okay, so like we can make a good case for design, right? Like you can look at these things that seem to require intentional agency, but then you wonder like if there is this like intelligent designer, um, like why on earth is it interested in like seemingly like these intricate parts of like biological systems? Because um, surely like you don't want to say like every single part of biology demands like intelligent design, but like there are these parts, like why these parts rather than other parts? Um, and, like trying to think through that. So like, what do you think about like wondering about like why would the designer be interested in like designing these parts of biology? Well, the theory of intelligent design, formally speaking, doesn't really uh, doesn't really address that kind of a question. It, it 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 simply makes an inference to the activity of an intelligent agent based on the based on the presence of signatures of intelligent activity present in natural systems that we ourselves know that we did not design. As to why the designing agent chose to make the bacterial flagellar motor or the uh, gene expression system or the compound eye of trilobites, um, I can only um, hazard a guess in the way that anyone else would. As a, as a uh, religious believer, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I think uh, the, the Bible uh, reveals that God is, a, is um, inherently creative. He's a creator who uh, takes uh, pride in his work and, uh, um, I was at the, the a neurology appointment today, and there were charts on the wall of the of the the way the brain and the 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 nervous system 
the way the nervous system connects to the brain. And the biblical phrase, fearfully and wonderfully made, did pop into my mind. It's quite extraordinary. The, the systems in the human body that we depend on. We post, posted something today on my Facebook page about the optimized um, design of the wrist joint as revealed by a uh, study of the, the great um, British uh, academic engineer, Stuart Burgess. He gave a wonderful talk on this at our, 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 um, our Philadelphia conference. I mean, there are many, many things in living systems that reveal an extraordinary functional logic when you study them carefully. And uh, they give every indication of, of, of having been produced by an intelligence. Uh, I, think, I think, you know, the, the, the beauty, the functionality, the exquisite um, design that's present in nature gives us, a, gives us some hints as to the nature of the creative mind responsible. Um, and I, it, it appears to me that, uh, especially with the, the beauty element, that maybe a short answer to your question is that God made all these wonderful things because it pleased him to do so. You know, he mm. was to reveal himself to his creatures, but also he, he it, it, there seems to be an element of sheer delight present in nature. If you look at butterflies or hummingbirds or winged insects, uh, my colleague Gunter Beckley, the paleontologist, was a specialist in dragonflies. And we've got them buzzing around all summer in our garden and they're truly extraordinary, you know? So yeah. um, I, 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 uh, I, I don't think it's the case where we should think the the diversity of living creatures suggests that perhaps the designer was wasting his time or something like that. I think rather it suggests um, a, a mind of great power and, and an inclination towards creativity and and a desire to convey to create a, a beautiful world around us. So I wonder what I'm wondering then is so. I like to think of like, um, obviously like I'm, like I'm a Christian, obviously. And I like to think about things like, um, and like question, like questions like, does God exist or things like this is like looking at like different theories about the world. Um, so like, I have this idea of like, you know, like there's like a perfect God that exists and we could look at like different data and we could look at things like intelligent design, um, and like say, Hey, like this is better expected like my, than by like this theory of like a theistic, like God who's a designer than like some other theory. Um, so I wonder then, like going back to intelligent design, you said originally that like it seems like like intel like bare intelligent design by itself doesn't really say um, why at all a designer would be interested in designing. Um, so I'm wondering then, like, is that a good theory then? Because we're wondering like if our theories like surely I'm like I'm not a scientist or a philosopher. I just kind of like to do this because I think it's super cool and it's something to fun to think about. But, like I would think that like good theories are going to be able to make some predictions about like what the world would look like um, if the theory. Oh, intelligent true. design makes lots of predictions, but. Uh, in a sense, you're asking a final cause question about mm -hmm. the intention of the designer. And um, I, I think there you probably, to the extent that that's revealed, I think you'd have to go to special revelation to find that out. I, I think God speaks to some of those questions through the Bible, if you believe the Bible is actually the word of God. But it, nature reveals um, that there is an intelligent agent, I believe. That's the argument that I've made. And I think that's a very significant conclusion by itself. I think it also reveals something of the attributes of that intelligent agent. Mm -hmm. um, the inte and this was the, the force of my second book. The, the theory of intelligent design as a, a formal um, theory of design detection is articulated, for example, by William Dembski, allows us to detect the activity of a designing mind uh, in the echo of the... Um, in the echo of the the effects left behind by that mind, so it does not allow us necessarily by by itself to determine the identity or all of the attributes of the designing agent. Uh, so, in my first two books, I simply inferred that a designing intelligence was responsible for, example, the uh, the dig the digital code stored in the DNA molecule. Um, I did not attempt to decide whether the designing agent was imminent and within the cosmos, something like a space alien or a transcendent mind. I obviously favor the latter hypothesis. And in my, last, my latest book, I look at other evidence besides the biological evidence to suggest that the best overall inference is not just to a designer of an unspecified kind or still less to a designer that is um, you know, lives on another planet or something, but rather to a designer that has the attributes that traditional theists have ascribed to God. 
a, tr a transcendent form of intelligence who is also active in the creation. And there I brought in the evidence from cosmology and physics to help make that case. Clearly no being within the cosmos could be responsible for the fine tuning of the laws of physics and the initial conditions of the physical world that have made life possible down the timeline. Um, is, is similarly, no, no alien on another planet could be responsible for the, the creation of the universe itself. So the other evidences that I looked at, the fine tuning of the basic physical parameters of the universe and the, uh, the evidence that we have that the universe itself had a beginning a finite time ago, suggesting the need for a transcendent non-physical cause to explain the origin of the universe itself. I think those evidences uh, coupled with the evidence of design we have in biology suggests theism is the best overall explanation when we look at competing worldviews. Um, so that's the kind of the argument of the, of the new book. Mm, yeah, that's super great. And I like, what are like some of those predictions that like ID makes? Um, Cause I think you brought that in, which is super helpful. Like what are some things that are like expected by intelligent design that um, wouldn't be expected by like other theories? Yeah, right. Well, there's there's two phases of the intelligent design research program as, as just a limited program of research within the biological sciences, for example. The first phase is the argument for intelligent design as the best explanation for facts we already have. And that's the kind of argument that I made in Signature in the Cell. It's the kind of argument that Michael Behe made in Darwin's Black Box. Um, features like the irreducible complexity of of molecular machines and circuitry or the digital code or the information processing system that exists inside cells, um, we think uh, suggest intelligent design is the best causal explanation, the most causally adequate explanation of, of features such as those that we find in the living world. I also made a similar argument about the pattern of fossil appearance, uh, the pattern of the appearance of, of new uh, forms of animal life in my book, Darwin's Doubt, suggesting that that pattern also, or arguing that that pattern also suggested intelligent agency. So that's an argument for intelligent design. Now, if you get to the conclusion, uh, hey, design is either the best or a pretty good explanation, uh, maybe I'm going to take it and run with it as a scientist, then you can start to generate predictions about what you ought to find in nature. Some predictions, and some of those predictions would be different than predictions that would be generated if you think that the, the driving force of, of the origin of new forms of life on earth was something like mutation and selection. If you have what sometimes is referred to as a bottom-up causal model where, where you have uh, lower, lower level forms of life giving rise to higher forms as a result of mutation and selection or similar processes, you'd expect one kind of pattern of emergence, you'd expect certain sorts of things to exist in the genome or in the fossil record that you wouldn't expect if you were dealing with a top-down pattern where, where a mind was responsible for the origin of new forms of life. And so it happens that intelligent design and neo-Darwinism or similar materialistic evolutionary theories generate very different predictions about what you should expect to find in living systems. For example, um, in the 1970s, it was first discovered that, that uh, the information in DNA uh, didn't just code for proteins. That in fact, a, a very small part of the genome coded for proteins and a big stretch of the genome had either unknown or no function at all. Now, this was exactly what the neo-Darwinists would expect. They thought that this method of uh, this mechanism of mutation and selection should generate a lot of, of, of um, non-functional uh, sections of genetic text, the, the, reflecting the trial and error nature of the, of the mechanism that they postulate as responsible for life. So when they saw that DNA only, only 3% of the DNA coded for proteins, and the rest didn't, they assumed that the rest of it was junk because that was a, a direct prediction of their model and they thought they'd stumbled onto confirmation of it. Uh, but the ID people starting in the 1990s said, well, you know, we accept that mutations are real processes. So we'd expect to see an accumulation of some random non-functional elements in the genome, but not 97%. Uh, we don't think that the signal would, would dwarf the noise if, 
uh, or rather the noise would dwarf the signal if this was actually an intelligently designed system. So we predict that uh, that junk DNA is going to turn out to be importantly functional. And in the 90s, Dean Kenyon uh, made that prediction, an ID proponent. Um, William Dembski made that pr pr prediction. Forrest Mims made that prediction, all ID proponents. And someone who was moving towards the ID position, Richard Sternberg, was also thinking along these lines and ended up doing some of the first important work with uh, um, uh, James Shapiro, the cell biologist from the University of Chicago, showing that uh, key elements of that, those non-coding regions were in fact functional. Now, fast forward to 2011 with the ENCODE project and the publication of a massive study of the non-coding regions. And it turns out that, that uh, it's all transcribed and the non-coding regions are in fact importantly functional. And there have been more and more confirmation of that. So you've got two different, uh, you've got a discriminating prediction. Neo-Darwinism says non-coding regions should be junk. ID using ID logic suggests um, that, that they ought to have a, a, at least a significant portion of them should be functional. And the vast majority of the non-coding regions have turned out to be importantly functional. So that's just one example of intelligent design, not just being an explanation of already known facts, but uh, rather it generates a prediction that research can, can, can uh, that, that research in the biological sciences can settle. Um, the ID prediction was those non-coding regions will turn out to be functional. When the prediction was made, we didn't know if they were or not, but ID turned out to have the, the right prediction and neo-Darwinism uh, the opposite. Mm. Thanks. Well, that's super helpful, Dr. Meyer. So I wonder then maybe let's look at a different objection. So what about the question of like malevolent design? So like you could look at like the whole process of like biological history and like point to all sorts of like organisms that seem to like just inflict suffering on other beings. So like how would this maybe pose a challenge if it does to like intelligent design looking at like potentially like evil things that um, were designed to like inflict like suffering on other creatures? Yeah, well, this is the broad question of what's called natural evil. There's a, it's a sub, a sub um, set, if you will, of a broader set of questions about under the heading of the problem of evil. And I think the problem of, of evil, at least the problem of human evil, has been um, well answered going back all the way to St. Augustine with the idea that, uh, that God allows um, humans to commit heinous acts because the consequence of not allowing them would be creating robots who didn't have free will and were therefore incapable of, of genuine love, affection, or choice. Um, and um, so th that's all made sense to me for a long time. The more difficult question comes in, in the, right where you're, in exactly where you're talking, on the topic that you're, you're raising. And that is, well, what about those things in nature that are, that inflict harm on humans that don't seem to have any uh, the, you know, that the don't owe their origin uh, to, to a human choice. Um, and there, I think there's actually, there's several classes of those problems. There, there's a so-called bad design, things like um, the, the vertebrate retina has been uh, classified as a bad design by some evolutionary biologist. And I think there's a very good answer to that. And that is that it's actually not a bad design. It's a good design. It's optimizing multiple uh, objectives at the same time. So it's a great example of, uh, of what's called constrained optimization in engineering. And so most of the examples of so-called bad design that neo-Darwinists put forward, the pandas thumb or the vertebrate, vertebrate retina, I think those are pretty easy to answer because when you look into the, when you look at those systems with a holistic engineering uh, point of view, it turns out that it's actually very elegant design. And, mm. It's, it's having to maximize multiple objectives simultaneously. So there are trade-offs, but the trade-off is pretty smart. It's pretty elegant. So I don't think that's a real problem. I think where you get in, where the more, more challenging thing is uh, things like um, killer bacteria and viri and things like that. And I think, interestingly, there's been some really good progress made on that within the ID research community in, in recent years. It turns out, uh, and I'm getting this uh, largely from conversations with uh, Scott Minnick, a microbiologist at the University of Idaho, who thinks about this very deeply. And uh, 
Don Ewart, a virologist. Um, and it turns out that the phenomenon of virulence, virulent bacteria or virulent um, uh, uh, viruses uh, invariably um, is a consequence of the loss of aboriginal genetic information. So take the plague bacterium, for example. I was fortunate enough to hear a lecture by Scott Minnick on the natural history of the plague, showing how this bacterium was um, a consequence that, that killed so many people in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. The plague was, was, um, arose as a result of four discernible mutations uh, in, an, in an aboriginal uh, bacterial species that was not harmful to humans. And these mutations could actually be identified and tracked, you know, using um, historical phylogenetic techniques. And so it's very interesting uh, moral that arises. The original system that was designed was not harmful to humans. The Darwinian mechanism with the, which the Darwinists attribute, to which the Darwinists attribute creativity was actually responsible for a degradation of that, that original and harmless, indeed good design and turning the the organism into something that was that was pathogenic and, and harmful, and so there's a kind of um, uh, an interesting juxtaposition here where neo Darwinism attributes creativity to the process of mutation and selection. Instead, we see in nature that na that natural selection, and mutation, often degrade designs in ways that cause the resulting organisms to be harmful to humans. Now, if I were just a design proponent, and that also, as I mentioned, a, a, a Christian, um, the fact of natural evil of that kind might be puzzling. But because I also have a, a broader biblical worldview, it's not, it's not surprising at all. In fact, it confirms a kind of prediction about nature that you could derive from, from the biblical text. We learn, learn in the Bible that there, is, there should be evidence of good design, um, the book of Romans tells us that, um, that, that from the things that are made, we can see the wisdom and the power of God manifest in nature. That's pretty awesome. We do. We see evidence of good design. But that same book also tells us that the creation is in bondage to decay, that there are processes at work that are degrading the original uh, design. And, and those processes, interestingly, are degrading information as they do that. So we argue that information points to the need for intelligence and natural processes degrade information. That's exactly what we see. And as a biblical design theorist, I would predict, I would expect to see both evidence of Aboriginal design that's good, but also uh, subsequent decay that may be harmful to humans, that nature itself is in bondage to decay in a way that, that, that should, that does cause us, um, does cause us harm. So, that's basically my take on it. I have a long footnote about all this at the end of chapter 14 of my new book, Return to the God Hypothesis. And I refer to some of this recent research that's been done in microbiology about the way in which um, mutational processes are uh, have degrade information to our detriment um, as far as generating um, nasty bugs and viruses. Mm. Well, thanks, Dr. Mara. That's, that's super helpful. So maybe like one last thing to kind of close up here is wondering, like, do all ID arguments like lead to God? Like, this is one of the things like when I um, have understood ID, intelligent design, it's really hard for me to get away from the idea like, is it like a theistic argument? I know like um, it's not, but for me, like I get that impression. I'm like, well, it just seems like this is like, like a theistic argument, like we're going to like argue for God. Um, so like do all ID arguments, like do they lead to God? Like, is there a way out? Like you could be an ID theorist and like not believe in like, like a theistic God. Well, there, there are ID theorists who, who don't, uh, who aren't theists. Um, but the, um, I think the answer is yes. ID argue not, or no, not all ID arguments lead directly to God. They lead in a penultimate sense to the conclusion of a designing intelligence of some kind. Um, what I've done is complement basic ID arguments with both um, arguments from physics and cosmology and some philosophical reasoning to, to uh, make the case that the, the best ID 
hypothesis is a theistic one. So I think you can take the argument in two stages. Um, is there evidence for an intelligent agency of some kind, yes or no? Uh, we've made the case that there's a lot of, a lot of such evidence in biology and in physics. Uh, but then there's the, next, the second order question, well, who is or the, the designing intelligence responsible for that evidence? Is it a space alien? Is it a deistic God? Is it a pantheistic notion of God? Is it a theistic notion of God? What's the best overall explanation? And mm -hmm. in the new book, I argue that theism actually provides the best overall explanation, that we have evidence of design after the beginning of the universe that can be explained by either an imminent intelligence, aka a, a, a space alien, or a transcendent intelligence, aka God. But then we have additional evidence for the creation and design of the universe as, as a whole that re really requires a transcendent intelligence that can affect the whole of the universe and bring the whole of the universe into existence. No being within the cosmos can do that. Therefore, uh, uh, an imminent intelligence is not a causally adequate explanation of the whole ensemble of evidence we have. Similarly, deism might explain the origin of the universe and its fine tuning from the beginning, but it doesn't do a good job of explaining infusions of information into our biosphere long after the beginning, because the deistic creator by definition only acts at the beginning of the universe. A pantheistic notion of God, I, I argue, is also insufficient because pantheism doesn't conceive of God as having a, as a conscious agency. It's not a person to whom you would communicate through prayer or something like that. And the pantheistic God is also coextensive with matter. So if the material, you, if the material, sorry, if the material universe had a beginning, um, then the before that the pantheistic God would not exist and therefore couldn't have acted as a cause to bring the universe into existence at, from that beginning point, from that singularity. Uh, similarly, the pantheistic creator not having a mind or pantheistic God not having a mind uh, can't explain fine tuning or, or the presence of information in biological systems. So I kind of do a, uh, I use the method of inference to the best explanation and examine the competing metaphysical hypotheses or worldviews to see which best explains the three key facts that we now have about biological and cosmological origins. The universe had a beginning, it's been finely tuned from the beginning, and there have been big infusions of information into our biosphere and our solar system since the beginning, suggesting a creator who is active and transcendent and very intelligent. Mm. Yeah, I like that. That's super great, Dr. Meyer. And yeah, there's a lot of great things here that we've thought about. Um, and I don't have too much else that I'm like really itching to talk about here. Um, anything else you want to say, like any other topics you want to bring up or anything yeah, you want to say? Just kind of fun thing that's been uh, on my mind lately. And that is um, I discovered recently, I have, we have a supporter who gave us a, 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 a copy of a, of a, a classical, book, uh, a, a, an old book. It's called The mm -hmm. Wisdom of God Manifested in the... In, the wisdom of God manifested in creation. Yeah. And it was written by John Ray. And I've recently been learning more about John Ray. It turns out that John Ray was the um, uh, uh, kind of pioneer in, in anatomy and physiology and botany mm -hmm. and developed the, the precursor to the Linnaean classification system that we still use today. Huh. He was a, uh, the, he's regarded as the founder of, of, of natural history in, in British science. But he's also the founder of natural theology, the idea that nature points to God. In his book, The Wisdom of God Manifested in Creation, um, manifested in the works of creation, is, is really the first and classic work of British natural theology. Uh, in addition, it turns out that John Ray was the uh, tutor of Isaac Barrow, who, who proved the first theorem of the calculus and who then tutored Newton, who developed the full integral calculus. Huh. So there's an amazing pedigree there. John Ray, Isaac Barrow to Newton, one was the tutor of the next. And then, and then Newton in his general scolium to the Principia, his epilogue to his great work on universal gravitation, extends that natural theological tradition and makes an exquisitely beautiful, elegant design argument uh, based on the fine tuning of the configuration of the planets in the solar system, where he says this most beautiful system of sun, planets, and comets 
could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. This is Newton in, in the, arguably the greatest work of physics ever written. And so you have this, this tradition of what's called British or English natural theology. It also, then an, another figure in that is, is James Clark Maxwell, who comes in the 19th century. Um, and so all of these guys were, uh, you know, th th this, this ID, idea that we've been developing in the last 30 years has a deep pedigree in Western science. And we're in a sense recovering the thinking of the people who made science possible in the first place. And for me, one final twist is that I only recently learned that John Ray was a member of the same Cambridge College where, that I attended, which was St. Catherine's. Huh. So uh, to me, that was kind of a cool thing to learn because a little coming full circle where we're just rediscovering what these uh, ancient masters already knew. Yeah, that is super cool thinking about John Ray. So is he, would he be like one of the first like ID theorists then you think? Like one yeah, of the originators? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you also have in Cambridge uh, a little bit after Newton, uh, you've got you've got William Paley, the, the English divine. He was a, John Ray was a scientist. Uh, Robert Boyle was a scientist. Knight, Newton was a scientist. Barrow was a mathematician. But you also had theologians who studied nature carefully and made these design arguments. And, that, and William Paley was one of those. Darwin, though, he ended up breaking with Paley and uh, arguing the opposite point of view, said that during his time in Cambridge as, a, as an undergraduate, as a student, the only thing that he was fascinated with, with Paley's work and that the only thing that he thought was really valuable about his Cambridge ed education was, was reading William Paley. So hmm. um, the, he was a, a very significant figure as well. And I think that, that tradition, I, th I think what has happened with uh, work... Uh, with contemporary work on intelligent design, especially with theorists like William Dembski, I think we've been able to advance, make new, break new ground in understanding what is it about a system that justifies an inference to intelligence. And whereas I think earlier scientists had largely intuitive uh, kind of ideas about that, Dembski has been able to make explicit a very rigorous method of design detection and I think that's allowed the modern intelligent design research community or movement to advance these ancient arguments and to break new ground and to make them even more rigorous. So I think that's an exciting aspect of what's happening today. It's a, 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 it's a resuscitation of the, the, the natural theological um, perspective with a bit more scientific rigor than even these great scientists of, of yesterday were able to, to advance. Mm. I, and well, I think Dembski in particular with a lot of that advance because it, the, what he addressed in the design inference was a, a, a very ancient question that goes all the way back to the Greeks. You find Cicero making design arguments within the Romans. You find, uh, uh, you know, Aristotle and Plato were interested in these questions. You find it in the Middle Ages, um, the interest in design um, and design arguments. Aquinas made design arguments. Uh, you find it all throughout the scientific revolution. You find it, you, interestingly, I just found an amazing passage in James Clark Maxwell, who was one of the top three physicists of all time. And he was a proponent of design um, and design reasoning. But I think, I think of all those figures, I think Dembski broke, broke new ground and, and has enabled us to, to identify the, the, the two features when present together uh, that allow us to reliably detect the activity of intelligence. And he calls those, of course, specification and small probability. Hmm. Well, Dr. Meyer, this has been such a great interview, and I feel like there's a lot that we covered here and a lot to chew on and think about. Um, so, like, where would you recommend people could, like, follow you, th follow you, connect with you, things like that? So awfully kind of you to ask, Zach. Uh, people can go to my website for the new book, returnofthegodhypothesis.com. Uh, that will you can navigate from there to the websites of, of my other books or to discovery or uh, there's a YouTube channel. Apparently, I've been kind of drug kicking and screaming into the 20th century with social <laughs> media by my assistant, Andrew McDermott, who's a social media wizard. So we've got a Facebook page. I've got a Facebook page. I do. Um, I try not to post dorky personal stuff. But um, in fact, today we posted something about this uh, lecture about the optimization of the of the wrist joint by by Stuart Burgess. We'll have something coming up about quantum cosmology. We put stuff up, up about everything on the Facebook page at 
I think it's Dr. Stephen C. Meyer at, or Facebook. But we've also got the return of the God hypothesis.com. That's a great website from which you can navigate to other websites and, and lots of ID content. We've got playlists, for example, of, uh, of animations of the molecular machines. We've got uh, playlists of debates that I've done. So if you're into this issue, there's a wealth of content and you can get from my webpage to Michael Behe's webpage or David Berlinski's webpage, or we have a, a whole, what do they call it? Uh, uh, ecosystem of uh, web-based content on intelligent design that's pretty awesome. Mm. The other thing people might look at, uh, really fun videos uh, called Science Uprising. Uh, and you might just Google those and find a few of those, including one that we did on this whole question of the origin of information and, and DNA. Mm. Well, Dr. Meyer, thank you so much for coming on. I'll be sure to put a link down below where how people can follow you, connect with you, things like that. I'll put the website down there. And yeah, that's it for today. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Dean Apologetics. If you're new, I always encourage you to like, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And if you value our content, um, go over and become a patron at patreon.com slash Apologetics. That's it for today. Um, we'll catch you next time and God bless.